reaping. You know, this is what we have about Thanksgiving. Our Father's many promises that he's given us, and we always, as you know the cliche, we reap what we sow. So if you want a real good life, you want to pay close attention because God has given us promises that if you do thus and thus, he's going to bless you. You're going to find contentment. And I want you to remember we have so much uh, going on in the world today of people saying, the sky is falling. You know, Al Gore mainly, okay. <laughs> and, but I want you to pay attention to what God says. That's what's important. And I'm just going to, we, we had this just recently. I want the last two verses in Genesis chapter 8. You don't even have to turn there unless you want to. I'm gonna, we're going to start in Proverbs here in a moment. But the last two verses of Genesis chapter 8 is Noah just got off the boat, okay? But the first, one of the first things he did, he made an offering to God. And he sacrificed some clean animals. And God loved that Seva. The fact that Noah remembered him and thanked him. That's what Thanksgiving is about, is to bring that love and that attention into your personal life from Almighty God. And this is what God did in verse 21 of chapter 8, the great book of Genesis in the beginning. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And you're, you're going to have bad people that can't be helped. They're out there. That's the way they are. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. That's his promise. He's not going to do that. What else did he promise concerning our environment? 22. While the earth remaineth. That's now. Okay. While the earth remaineth. Seed time and harvest and cold and heat. You don't have to worry about global warming. We're always going to have cold if you don't stick around a month or two, all right? And get your long handles out. You're going to need them, okay? And summer and winter, you're always going to have it. And day and night shall not cease. God's in control. You're going to have it. That's it. He said it. No more need be said. And... Um, it, um, when people talk about global warming, they should have been in Gravit, Arkansas last winter when we lost half our trees with ice, you know. Regular refrigerator went through here, you know, and I, 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 thank God, because he's in control. And hey, what he sends, that's what we need, and we can cut it. We deserve it one way or the other, and just take care of business. Reaping, reaping, reaping. I think some of the best advice, I want you to open your Bibles to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Some of the best advice on how to be blessed for the whole family. And, and coming down again with the subject of what you sow, you're going to reap it. Okay, That's the way it is. Proverbs 22, verse 1, and it reads, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. In other words, your name is your reputation. Your name is how people deal with you. Why is it better than silver and gold? Because you can have all you want. Okay. If you have a good name, people trust you. They'll do business with you. And you're not just a flash in the pan of rich today and, hey, it's gone tomorrow like the prodigal son did. You have personality. You have, your name is your bond. Always let it be that way. You know something? If you and I make a contract, we don't have to go to a lawyer's office. If I give you my word, that's the way it's going to be. I was raised that way and I will never change. Once that word is given, that's it. You hang to it, okay? So uh, your, a good name brings blessings. A good name in a community causes people to seek you out. They want to do business with you. They want your advice. They want your leadership. And, and uh, so it is. So naturally, 
you're going to gain in all ways, not, not just riches of money or anything, but in friends and people and God's love. Uh, that favor, which is his grace, is so very important. Verse 2, the rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. They're all his children. Every one of them, they're his children. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple uh, pass on and are punished. The unsuspecting just, well, I wonder which way to go. They never put your mind in gear and think ahead a day, okay? Always plan ahead. You know, um, one of the first things you learn as a pilot flying an airplane is don't, don't get behind the airplane. Do you know what that means? That means don't let it get ahead of you to where you're lost. You don't know what you're doing. You stay ahead of it. You, you plan ahead of it. You plan where you're going, and if it's closed in, you've got an alternate, and you've got the fuel and the wherewith to get there. Okay? Well, plan your own life that way. Look, look ahead a day, and plan so that if something comes up that's even that's not pleasant, handle it. Have, have a way of getting around it, through it, over it, or whatever, or knocking it out of the way. You can do it. You're a can-do type person, blessed of God. So, but don't be one of these unsuspecting people that just wander out in this world. You're going to get stung if you do, because there are people out there waiting for you. You know, if you've been blessed and have a few shekels, they're going to take care of it for you. Okay. They're going to unload your purse. All right. Verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord. I like to translate that reverence rather than fear. Reverence of the Lord are riches and honor and life, eternal life. Reverence and being humble before Almighty God, studying his letter to you, taking his advice, guides you through the pitfalls of life. You know, you're not going to fall in the ditch if you'll pay attention to what your Father advises you. Verse 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the forward, the crooked, okay, the wicked. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. He that keeps his self and thinks ahead it's going to know where those a snare is a trap, okay? You're not going to walk into a trap blindly. You're going to smell that trap a mile away. And you're going to avoid it, okay? If he wants to jump in his trap, let him jump in his own trap. Right? You're too busy. You're too blessed of God to, to be sucked in that way. You know better, okay? If they're just out there, my friend, God made that clear to you, all right? What did he say back in that 8th chapter of Genesis? There's evil people in the world, okay? 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a true saying. That's something to sow that you want to hang on to. Because you will reap great rewards of that by having a blessed person as a child. Raise them up in the way they should go. They may not always be obedient to you. They may disobey you at times, but they'll never forget the right way of what parents say. Okay, never. So hang on to it and go for it. The rich, verse 7, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. That's, that's why I tell you stay out of usury as much as you can. You don't need it. You can make, it's, it, you know, it takes a little bit longer, but you can always make payments to yourself and then pay cash and buy it, what, half price. You like to go around paying double price for everything and have these things come in every month, you know, and just say, whoa, wow, adding up here. Yeah, do it to your, pay that interest to yourself. I mean, lay hands on the old washing machine, kick it, uh, you know, shake it and jar it around, scrub it by hand, but make those payments to yourself 
and then go down and pay cash, I mean, green stuff, all right? And bring that mama home and make mama happy and everybody's happy, all right? You don't have those bills coming in at, at the first of every month and you wonder why we don't have enough groceries or why we ran out so quick. Stay away from usury or you'll be, uh, the, the borrower is always servant to the lender. It's just the way it is. Now, I know that some of you young people in getting started, you have to borrow money to buy a house and a car or something to even be able to work. Use your, this, not this, okay? Use your head. Verse 8, he that soweth iniquity, this is why we came here, he that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. Vanity means emptiness, nothingness and the rod of his anger shall fail. It won't do him any good. The calamity of it is what? If you, if you sow iniquity, don't expect a harvest. You're not going to have one. It's going to be empty. You, you did all that for naught. You were kidding yourself. So always do what's right, and you'll always reap a harvest. That's God's promise. Always, and you know what? Never, uh, sometimes a man will bet on some other man's trick. Like, uh, I probably shouldn't go here, but we've had a lot of some people. I, I'm going to do it. I never talk money, but I'm going to now. We've had this thing in the past where you don't have to make a down payment on the house. Get rich by simply signing property, you know. Well, there's just one problem with that. Pretty soon the market comes down and the loaner says, it's payday, I'm calling all bets. And they lose everything they got, okay? Because they listen to a scheme. Okay. Let, let me tell you something. Do you know how you get rich quick? With these hands, okay? You work, and with this, you think. And you do these things that God has taught you here. Stay away from usury. Plant something that's profitable, not vanity. And you'll harvest something. You'll get ahead. It, and don't be impatient. It took me years to make my first million. Okay. <laughs> years. Finally, I gave up on it and started on the next one. I, I'm kidding. I, I, I'm rich because I have a roof over my head and four square, three squares, four sometimes. You know. But, you know, it's uh, rich is in the eyes of the beholder, I suppose. But God blesses those that think. Okay. That think what? Think his way. That follow him. If you plant iniquity, that means sin and unprofitable things, you're going to harvest nothing but trouble. And it's going to rise up and bite you. Okay? It'll do it every time. That's some of the most simple advice that God can give you. And that's what's so wonderful about harvest when it piles up. That's thanksgiving. That's what we're thankful for is God's advice and his blessings. Um, verse 9, he that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. He, he helps people out, okay? And you know something? You can, you can give a poor person a fish, and he'll be hungry again tomorrow. You can teach him how to fish, and he won't be hungry again, okay? So, spiritual giving of truth and wisdom raises people up and makes somebody out of them rather than somebody floating from payday to payday to payday. You wonder if I'll make it. Well, according to God's word, you will if you do it his way. You're going to gain. You're going to harvest. Verse 10, listen carefully. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go, go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. You know, the average Christian says, we've we got to keep them all. No, we don't. No, 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 no. If somebody absolutely is such a disruption and a scorner that they can't listen to the word, 
They want to contend with it every time. Get rid of them. Okay. I mean, tell them, you know, you're not happy studying with us. Go, find somebody you can be happy with because we love you. Okay. We love you a lot. We want you out of here. <laughs> okay. Get rid of them. Okay. You don't, life is too short to put up with contention and scorners. Okay. And, and you know, scoffers are worse than it's not going to happen. We've been here forever. We're going to be here forever yet. But things are going to change. You can count on it, okay? It's going to change big time. So don't, don't put up with the scorner. Verse 11, He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. That's the way it is. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. Got it? And he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. That's the way God operates. And we could go on the next, the next verse is, well, let's cover it. The slothful, that's a lazy man, okay? The slothful man saith, there is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. And, I, and we'll stop there, but he's always afraid to do something. He, he's too lazy to get out there and take on the lions, okay? The tigers are easy, but lions can be rough, okay? Uh, they're, they don't exist, and in, in, in a lazy person is always going to have an excuse to not do something. That's bad business, okay? Why? You're not sowing anything. If you're too lazy to open the door, and you know what God, in this same book of Proverbs, you know what God says about a lazy person? You're nothing but a set of hinges to a mattress. All you can do is flop from one side to the other like a hinge of a door. Okay? He doesn't too much care for lazy people. So, you sow what you reap. But if you sow vanity, your head coming out the gate. Okay. So, make sure that what you sow brings fruit. God loves a person that produces. Okay. So, do uh, it God's way. Okay. Go, go um, if you would, to one book past Daniel. You know where Daniel is? Then that'd be the great book of salvation, which is Hosea. That's what Hosea means in the Hebrew tongue, is salvation or savior. It tells us how to, how to really be saved, so to speak. Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. You know, you know what this book of Hosea is about. It's, it's kind of a parable in a sense where God told Hosea to go marry a harlot. Why? Because the ten tribes had gone north over the mountains. They didn't, they didn't know who they were. And they'd kind of chased other gods until that's what God kind of classed them as. He said, go up there and straighten them out. Take them to wife and and children were born in the very names, the Ami and Lo Ami, and, and uh, uh, have meanings for another time, another place. Verse 10 of chapter 10, the book of Hosea, salvation. It is in my desire that I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. Uh, furrows mean we're getting ready to plow, or right? we have plowed. And Ephraim, do you know who Ephraim is? That's the largest of the ten tribes. It means the ten tribes, okay? And Ephraim is an heifer that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn. But I passed over upon her fair neck, I will make Ephraim to ride, Judah shall plow, and Jacob shall break his clods. They're going to get it right. They're going to all work together. In other words, you've got to do all of those things if you're in agriculture or you're not going to have a crop. Okay. You first got to get out there and fallow the ground. Then you've got to have a harrow that breaks up the big clods and gets it down where it's really a nice seed bed. And, um, and then, uh, naturally, Ephraim is 
gathering the corn, you know, and he liked to gather the corn. Heifer is a tame heifer, and she takes a little bite of corn every once in a while because the servant's worth the it's higher. That's why she likes to do it. She's getting fed, all right? Right from the top. Verse 12, listen carefully. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. That's love, okay? Break up your fallow ground. Prepare it well. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. We've got a lot of trouble in the world. And you better be thinking about this. This is spiritual. And you need to get your mind, the, se the seed bed, to receive real truths. Whereby you are, your harvest is truth and your path is to follow God in Righteousness, what does righteousness mean? Doing what's right, period. Okay. Uh, everybody born naturally knows right from wrong, basically. Okay. So seek that that is right. And the seedbed of your mind, if you love the Lord, that's the beginning of knowledge. Okay. That, that's what brings you blessings. You know, you can be the sharpest person in the world, and you might get by pretty good. But a sharp person that has God as his director and blessed is going to do fantastically well. In other words, if you don't have God, you're in bad shape. I don't care how sharp you are. You've got to have him, and you've got to have his blessings. Example, you can take a seed, and you can plant it in the proper soil, and then you're going to make it grow? I don't think so. I do not think so. He that created that little seed placed within it an embryo. And that's God's business as to whether that embryo sprouts and new life comes forth. Man can't do that. God can. That's why without him, you're not going to have the sprouting of that spiritual embryo in your life. And you're going to have a big minus. That's not good. You need to follow him and allow that seedbed of your mind to be fertile ground. You know, the parable of the sower should be hitting your mind about what happened to some of that seed. Some of it fell among thorns. Some of it on the path that had been beaten down and so hard it couldn't take root. Get the ground ready up here, okay, to receive the blessings of God. Okay, um, 13, you have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men, your politicians, your leaders. I hope most of you understand to examine leaders, okay? Because you've got some, you know, it is written also in the word that in the end times we would have children, the minds of children leading us. Okay. Well, look around, wake up, smell the coffee or whatever you're cooking. Okay. It's there. Okay. And, and lies, it would seem to me that lies come easier every year to politicians. And used to, at least they tried to bread them over. You know what breading something over is to bread the fish over so much you can't see the fish, okay? Well, you bread the lie over so much, a simple person can't tell it's a lie. But these scriptures are true. And unfortunately, you have to be able to decide what's right, okay? 14, therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled as shalman, spoiled Beth Arbel. In the day of the battle, the mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. You don't want any part of that. Uh, I, I think probably the proper translation for these Hebrew names probably would explain it to you better. If, if there's very little written about this battle. Shalman means fire worshiper. Okay, You know what a fire worshiper is? It's somebody that doesn't worship God. All right. And Beth Arbel means the house of ambush. It, it was terrible. There was a murderer there. And it happened. And our people are being ambushed every day. 
And it's not, it's not a war of wars. It's ambush after ambush after ambush. Verse 15, so shall Bethel, Bethel means the house of God, the true house of God, do unto you because of your great wickedness in a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. What? Through one worldism. It's going to come to pass. It's going to happen. And there you have it. Is that something for us to worry about? No, it's written. We don't have to worry about it. It's written. And our Father has forewarned us. I'll tell you what, let's Let's skip the next book, Joel, and go right on to Amos. Okay, the next one of the minor prophets. <clears throat> book of Amos. You know, we were talking in the book of Luke about Amos this past week, and they come up and question Amos, and Amos chapter 7, verse 14, that's not where we're going. We're going to the very last chapter of Amos. But in 7:14, Amos says, I, I'm not a preacher, and I'm not a prophet. All, I've, all my responsibilities are taking care of the sycamore fruit. And, of course, the sycamore was the Egyptian fig, that its leaves were heart-shaped, made fantastic uh, shade, and they planted them along the wayside so people walking could stay a little bit cool, and they smelled good. The fragrance was fantastic, and the figs actually grew in clusters out of the trunk of the Egyptian fig. And they had to be pierced the figs had to be pierced three and a half days before harvest or you couldn't eat them. So Christ is written all over that when you stop and think a moment, okay? That, that's what Amos did. He said, I'm not a preacher. That's the trouble with a lot of people today. They think they're prophets. We've already had our prophets. They're fantastic. You can't play one-upmanship on them. Why? God spoke through them. Who's going to speak through you? Okay. Well, it's my imagination. Oh, well, we don't want to hear your imagination. We've got the prophets. Okay. Now, we have teachers of the prophets and the word. That's beautiful. But uh, we've, like, like old Amos said, I'm not a prophet. But God used him mightily. And uh, we're going to read of him here a little bit concerning the end times. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. This is coming to the end where we sift out. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. In other words, Christ is going to be king again on earth. And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old going to be just like then, only king of kings is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. They that may possess the remnant of Edom, Edom is Russia, okay, Rush in the Hebrew tongue, and of all the heathen, and here's a qualification, which are called by my name. Do you understand what that means? That means all people that are converted to Christianity that are called by his name, Christ man, Christian, saith the Lord that doeth this. Who does that? The Lord. That's his plan. And that's the way it's going to be. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. You know, this, this Greek word in the Septuagint in the New Testament that I'm using about reaping is, and harvest is fruit of the vine. And every time Christ was telling them, take of this, I will no longer drink of it with you until I drink of it anew with you in my kingdom, this same terminology is used. That's why that when that kingdom is established, that new wine, his blood, is with us here on earth. 
and he is with us after the order of Melchizedek forever and ever, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And um, behold, the days come, 13, saith the Lord, that the, we got that, didn't we? Okay. No, we didn't. We're going to get it again here, okay? I'll read it again. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman will overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, uh, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt with milk and honey, okay? And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. Not somebody else. Not some, nobody's going to rip you off. You're going to have your own garden. You're going to eat your own produce. They're not going to take it away from you. Why? God's not going to allow it. It's over. Done with. And I will plant them upon their land. It's God's planting. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Father knows where his children are. God didn't lose anybody. Some people have lost their way. But God hadn't lost anyone. That's why he chose his elect for these end times. He knows them. He knows where they are, and he knows they will obey him. He knows they will sow what it is he wishes them to sow. And he can count on them. And that pleases him very much. That's why that when you are one of God's elect, when you follow him, when you love him, that he blesses you. He sees to it. Okay. Now, we're going we're to go to the New Testament here for a while. Go with me to John, the book of John, St. John, that is. Jesus has walked up to the well of Jacob many, many years later. And there's a woman there. And she's drawing water. He walked a long ways to get to this woman. And she said, our father that dug this well, and he said, but if you drink of this water, his water, you'll never thirst again. She said, I, I wouldn't mind having some of that. Well, it was a long path down there. I don't know how many of you had to carry water. Not many of you, I'd bet, to, to the house. And I've had to, okay? I don't know. That doesn't make me eat better than anyone else, but it means I'm old. Okay. <laughs> and from Oklahoma. A lot of Oklahoma people carry water. Okay. And uh, anyway, um, I forgot where I was going there for a moment. Okay. She said to him, I wouldn't mind having some of that. And he said, uh, go bring your husband. She said, I, whoa, I don't have one. And in John 4, um, 17, he said, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that sayest thou truly. You're telling me the truth. So I just wanted to set the stage of how God uses people. He came a long ways to talk to this woman. And she goes on her way, and all of a sudden, here comes the disciples. And uh, we pick it up in verse 31, John 4, 31. I'm just synchronized your mind so you know where we're at. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. And he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. 33, Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Has some one of you slipped him something we don't know about? 34, And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. That's my purpose. Now, naturally, his work was to reach whomsoever will. And this woman, who uh, no doubt was not an Israelite, though she said her father was Jacob, but 
uh, or, and had drifted, had been married five times. Hey, listen, that's enough in some churches to almost get you run out. You would be in the back row, okay, for sure. It didn't seem to bother Jesus, though, did it? Didn't bother him at all. Okay. He just said, let's stick to the line. You, you've answered truthfully. But he, he's got to get it done so that everyone can have that salvation. 36, and he, uh, rather, verse uh, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. In other words, when it comes to harvesting people, you don't wait four months. You don't wait any time. You don't wait till the season. This is the season. This is the season that you take truth. And the way people are hurting, they need that truth. There's, I'm going to tell you something. They're starving for it. They come from all over the country to various places to find that word, the real word, the truth to be fed the real Word of God, that food that lasts forever, that builds your soul, that takes care of you. And, and so it is. That's the work that he had to do. He said, look around you, get to work. That's what he's insinuating here. You need to be ready to get it on. There's people need you. There were his disciples, of course, disciplined to teach the Word of God. Verse 36, and he that um, reapeth receiveth wages, you can count on it, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. It goes, it lasts you forever. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. What, what he's saying here, he's implying, and we'll say in a moment, the prophets have already planted, they've got the ground sowed and everything. All you have to do is go in and harvest. The word's out there. Okay. The, the prophets of long ago taught the word. The apostles and disciples followed it up. They taught the word. Now's the harvest. Okay. So you want to be careful when you try to say, well, I think I'm a prophet. And you mark a person that claims to be a prophet in this generation. Okay. Carefully. Um, verse 37. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. We're a team. Okay, That's what he's saying. A team from day one. 38, I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. You didn't plant it. Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah, Amos, uh, uh, Hosea, they sowed it. Okay. You didn't. But you get out there and reap it and get paid for an eternity participating in, in that uh, equation. Okay. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. You don't ever want to forget that. The forerunners, the prophets, the disciples. 39, watch this real carefully. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. That Samaritan woman that had five husbands and was living with a no boy swayed most of that town into accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will use whomever he chooses to use, whomever believes. She believed. When he told her, there, there was no way that possibly a man could know that much about her and not even be from that area. And she could tell by his countenance that she could recognize truth. And then we're not going to go on past that point here, but, but uh, they begged him to stay and teach a few more days. And then they said, we believe because of, we believe because of what she said. Now we believe what you say. So that's the way the seed is harvested. That's the way the truth is harvested. It's souls. It's people. It's people that you care about. 
people that need that truth to change their lives, to not, not give them just something to pass by, but eternal life. Eternal life. That's real reaping. And that's what he's talking about here. Let's go to Galatians, the book of Galatians, real quick. Right after Corinthians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can't con God. Don't, don't ever think for a minute he even knows what you're thinking, okay? For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh uh, reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall, uh, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. That's what's important. And you know something? We can't even imagine how wonderful that is to be there with him to have all the smog, the pollution, the trouble gone and to have life eternal in one of the most beautiful places you could have ever have seen in your life. That's what it's about. And you know something? That's right here on earth when things are put back as it was. Verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't give up. That's, that's a terrible thing, is to see somebody really work and, and go, and then all of a sudden, I just give up. You know, that, uh, Why? Lazy? Um, uh, deceived? What? Don't, don't ever give up. God doesn't like quitters. Okay. He doesn't. When, when you feel like giving up, pray for strength. You know, don't, don't be a backward or afraid to ask God for something you need to do his work. You need strength, you need knowledge, you need wisdom, ask for it. Don't be shy, don't be bashful, don't hold back. Ask and receive. He hears you, and he will answer. If you're sincere, you can't con him, like he said. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. That's to say God's elect, the family, and those that believe. And, and then Paul goes in and says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you. He, he meant he was signing this with his own hand. Luke wrote it, okay? But Paul couldn't see real good. He was blinded on the road to Damascus that day. I mean, he said, I just want to show you that I'm the one doing this. And he wrote real big, you know, Paul, okay, when he signed off. And that's the way it is. Now, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Let's go to the book of Revelation to complete. Chapter 14. The final reaping, the final harvest. There's one part of this harvest and reaping that is done to those that receive the mark of the beast, okay? Those that are deceived by the Antichrist, they get harvested with a sickle, okay? And do you know what happens to them? Well, we're going to find out, okay? Revelation 14, verse... Um, Verse 11. This incidentally, this particular chapter is written to earth, the people on earth, okay? The seal has kind of erupted here, has been in, put, embedded in the minds of people that know the truth. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they had no rest day or night who worshiped the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. That's why you don't want to go there. He's coming as the false Jesus. And many people are going to worship him. Why? They haven't been taught. They're not expecting it. Here is the patience of the saints. 
Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Here's what happens to them. Okay, got it? Get ready. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. That's to say those that, um, that die but are not spiritually dead. You got it? Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Your works of standing against the false Messiah, your works of planting good seed, your works of following Almighty God, you take with you. A lot of people say, you can't take nothing with you to heaven, baloney. Okay. Your works go with you. You know what? That makes up your white gown that you wear in heaven. All right? Long flowing thing because so many righteous acts. All right? And if you don't have any righteous acts, guess what? There you stand. Okay. So, and that goes with you. Don't ever forget that particular verse. Here comes the harvest on who and what. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. You don't want to be harvested by this, my friend. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. The time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. They wouldn't listen. Got it? They worshiped the false Christ. They, worshiped, they received the mark of the beast, which simply is to say they received Satan's mark in their forehead and were deceived. It is made so clear in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21 that the false Christ comes first. And you will have people to this day where it will say, there's two in the field and one was taken. The subject is the Antichrist coming first, and yet you will have some preachers that will say, oh God, I want to be the first taken. <laughs> Give me a break. You know, that, that's terrible, absolutely terrible to wish for something like that, okay? Uh, so the old sickle comes out and... Another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle, 18. And another angel came out from the altar, right from the altar of God, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. You know, you don't harvest grapes with a sickle, okay? But this time it's going to be done. That's going to squish grapes, got it? That's what the impression is supposed to leave. And the angels thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now, do you think you're going into the winepress of the wrath of God? Some say, well, I don't know. Well, is God mad at you? I don't think so. You're following him. So you don't take part in that. You're the one that went and your works followed you. It's written in the book of life. These are those that worshiped the false Christ, that worshiped the mark of the beast, which is, where, where is the mark? In your forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain. You're supposed to use it. God expects you to. So here we see the final reaping. And we see the final harvest. You can be thankful that you don't even have to consider that last scripture or worry about it. Because God is only angry at those that just won't listen, won't follow. Don't even try. And if anything, work against him by soliciting and furthering the flyaway doctrine. When it's written very clearly in Ezekiel 13, he's against it. He says, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls when my outreaching arms are there to save them. Sad, what? But what a thanksgiving. And what a time to be thankful that God loves you. That you don't have to worry about the wrath, the, the, the vat, wine vat of God where he straightens out. I can tell you one thing. I know our Father, and I know how loving it is. 
when they come out of that vat, we're going to teach them in the millennium, and they're going to listen. I mean, they're, they're going to be ready, more than ready to listen, most of them. That's going to be a beautiful time. Everything our Father does is beautiful. Correction and discipline is beautiful. Okay. It's necessary. And that's what our Father's in the business of, is loving his children and raising them up in the way they should go. And even in the very end of the millennium, they're not going to depart from it unless they really want to join you-know-who. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the harvest. Thank you, Father, with this thanksgiving of the, the promises that you've made us in your word, Father. We claim them and live by them. We ask your blessings in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. To gather them together to battle, a number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went to the breadth of the earth, compassed the camp, and yep, and that. How can this be the same battle as Ezekiel 39, which occurs before the millennium? It is a, it's a statement, a figure of speech that means the unbelieving infidels of the world gather together. It's just, it just simply means the um, non-believing infidels of the world that still, after the end of the millennium, fight against Satan. I'm sorry, that go with Satan and fight against Christ. They're, they're called Gog and Magog because it's a statement of degradation. Uh, Rebecca from Indiana. I'm trying. Is it possible for a person to have some tiny memory, better said, a feeling more than a memory of the first earth age? It, it is, it is, um, you know, I, I always think of George Patton when I'm asked this question. Uh, great general. And he loved to go to the lands where old battles were fought, ancient. He was an expert when it came to battles uh, in this earth age. And he always felt he had been there, even at the farmers. Why? Because he paid attention to it. If he was interested in it here in flesh body, before he came here, he was interested also. So he had that fleeting moment. And I, I think that most of God's elect at time might have that fleeting moment where it seems I've been here before, I've seen this, I've done that, just a fainting glimpse, but not something you would make a religion out of or make any great thing out of it. It's just life, okay? We're, you only have one soul, and that soul was with God in the first earth age when he said to the Elihim, let us make man in our image, that same soul or self has been through this earth age and it will go through the next or to hell, one or the other, okay? But it's still the same soul. And the thought process is involved therein. Very strange. Yogesh from Georgia. Uh, please explain Luke chapter 13, verses 4 and 5 regarding the tower that fell on the 18 men. Would you say this was their lot in this earth age because of perhaps what they did in the first earth age? Not, not necessarily. Uh, I, I think you would lose the point that Christ is trying to make in that chapter, and we'll be there in a day or two. It's the next chapter coming up, as a matter of fact. What does 18 mean? That's where you lose it if you're not careful. Bondage. And you can put yourself into bondage of happenstances. They just were, hey, 
they were walking along, the tower fell, and it killed them. They were just in the wrong place at the right time. Okay. It had just happened. And accidents do happen. And that's what Christ is telling you there. They weren't better or worse than anyone else. They just were in the wrong place. They were there when that tower come crumbling down and crushed them. Okay? Uh, accidents happen, and that's what Jesus wanted you to know. But the main thing is don't let bondage encircle you. We'll, we'll get that in the next lecture. We're just about, we're, this is, 12 is a real long chapter. We'll be in 13, we'll cover it. Leo from Oklahoma. Why do you celebrate Christmas when we know it's a pagan day? You do? Uh, Leo, I'd be real careful if I were you. Do you know, do you know what happened on December the 25th? As far as Christians are concerned? You better. And it's very important. What happened on December the 25th was the conception. That's when the Holy Spirit passed over Mary and Christ began to dwell with us. She ran on December the 25th to where Elizabeth, her cousin, was. And as she approached Elizabeth, John, who was six months in the womb, left. Because the Holy Spirit was with us on December the 25th, Jesus Christ. I would be real careful about calling that a pagan day. Now, I don't worship Christ, celebrate Christmas as most people do, but I do celebrate it as the day of conception because it is the course of a buy of documents. That I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all a lot because you enjoy studying Father's Word in depth, whereby mainly God loves you for it. It's the letter he sent to you, and he wants you to understand it so that you can have peace of mind. When you make his day, he's going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, when you bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, you stay in his word. Hey, every day in his word is a good day. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad, being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book of instruction.
Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God. I'm glad you all could get together with us and we get into our Father's Word to continue our discussion on your destiny. Some of you do, and you've known it since you were a small child. There was more to God's Word than you'd been taught. And it's so good when you have that hunger, that unceasing desire to search the letter that your Father wrote to you, knowing there was something there for you, knowing that our Father is a God of love and peace, 